to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 27, the Bible says, It is appointed to man once to die, and then the judgment. We welcome you today to our study about the truth concerning heaven and hell. We're glad you've joined us for our study today. It is of eternal importance as we think about the destiny of every man as he lives his life in accordance with the Word of God. And so we hope that you'll locate your Bible and have it handy as we're going to think about eternity from God's view. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by individual members of the Church of Christ and congregations of the Lord's Church in your area. The Church of Christ would love for you, and your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly on Sunday or Wednesday. You would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. And so we encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. You'll find a group of people there who just want to follow the Bible, who love God, who are concerned about souls, and who are warm and kind to visitors. And so please visit the Lord's Church in your local area. Also, we'd love to help you here at the Gospel of Christ. Please visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a wide variety of audio and video and uh, transcripts available online. We'd love for you to check those out. They're all available free of charge for download. And so visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. Uh, from there, you can fill out a media request form. If you'd like to have a digital download of those, you can select that. Or if you need a video or CD, we can make that available to you as well. And friend, we also have apps available for the smartphone, both Apple and Android. You can download those from the respective Play Stores, and we want to encourage you to do that. And friend, our, our mission here at the Gospel of Christ is simply to take the whole gospel to the whole world. As we talk about matters today that are specific to eternity, we want you to know that we speak out of a love for your soul. The only thing we want for you is for you to go to heaven. More than anything, we want you to know God, know His will, and know that you're right with Him. And so again, we hope you've got your Bible handy as we're going to consider this wonderful subject today. What's it going to be like in hell? You know, if I could just get a little glimpse, if I could peek in the windows of hell, it would probably be enough to prevent anybody from wanting to go there. And so let's try today to see what it's going to be like if one is lost on the other side. Would you open your Bible with me to Luke chapter 16? And I want us to consider the story of Lazarus and the rich man. And as we understand, of course, this is... Uh, the Hadean realm, this is paradise and torment, and of course, what we can tell, the only difference between heaven and hell is the eternal aspect. But look in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. The Word of God records this. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, 
have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from there to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Friend, as we think about how the tables are turned, on the other side, between Lazarus and the rich man, it gives us a picture into, an insight into how bad that place called torment is going to be. What's it going to be like on the other side if a person is lost? Friend, being in torment is a, being lost is like, is being in a place of horrible, horrible torment. I want you to think about the idea of torment, agony, agonizing something that is almost uh, too hard to even contain. Ungetoverable is kind of the idea. He was in torment in Hades. He lifted up his eyes and he saw Lazarus afar uh, off in Abraham's bosom. That idea of torment is being in such agony, such pain, such heartache that you can't hardly even contain that. It's ungetoverable. Can you imagine being in a place like that? for all eternity, being in a place where every second of every day you, you, you wish you could die, but you live forevermore, being in such pain that you would long for death, but you would live in that state forever and ever. Can you imagine, have you ever been so sick you just wished you could almost die. You ever been so sick you thought death has got to be better than this? Maybe you had some dreaded disease. M maybe you were struggling with something. Maybe you're going through treatments, whatever it may was. And you thought to yourself, death has got to be better than this. Can you imagine living in that state of mind, being in that state of mind for all eternity? You talk about torment that'd be unimaginable. Friend, that's just a peak into the window of what hell is going to be like. It is going to be a place of horrible, horrible torment. What else is it going to be like on the side of destruction? Hell is going to be a place of unquenchable fire. Listen to Luke 16, 24 again. The rich man cried and said, here's this one request, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am tormented in this flame. I want you to think about for just a moment the hottest fire you've ever been around. I mean, it was so hot that it would almost burn your skin. It was so hot that you just couldn't get close to it. Have you ever been around a real, real hot fire? Imagine that flame and you being in that for all eternity. Uh, the Bible describes hell as a lake of fire. It describes it as torment in flame, ungetoverable flame. Um, those who visit burn victims, there are special wards and there are special hospitals for those who have been burned. And those who visit people in the, those hospitals say that you can hear the cries of those people down the halls, their, not only their skin, but their nerves and their nerve endings and everything has just been burned and, and the agony of that. Friend, can you imagine being in a place like that for all eternity, tormented in these flames? What else is hell going to be like? This may be one of the worst things about it. Hell is going to be a place of mental recognition. Listen to the words of Luke 16, 25 again. 
But Abraham said to the rich man, Son, here it is, remember. I want you to think about what one of the worst things. Imagine especially this way. If you knew what God's will was, and you had heard the gospel, and maybe you had even obeyed the gospel, and you'd lived as a Christian, maybe even for a part of your life, you know what the worst thing about hell would be? Sitting in the halls of hell, in agony and torment in the flames, and saying to yourself, I had the pearl of great price. I was on the road to heaven. At one time I was a Christian. All I had to do was remain faithful. And for the momentary sin of the flesh, I gave all that. Can you imagine sitting in eternity forever remembering that you were a Christian at one time? Remembering how good it was? Remembering the joy that you felt when you knew that you were right with God and knowing you were headed down the right path and, and, and gave all that up for momentary pleasure? One of the worst things about hell will be the mental recognition. Son, remember. Remember what it was like on the other side. Then as we think about that place called torment, one of the greatest things about, uh, one of the most horrible things about hell will be the eternal separation. There will be a separation between those who are lost and those who are saved. There will be a separation from God and His angels, and Satan, and His workers. And there will be a separation from good and happy and sad and tormented. Listen to the words of Luke 16, 26 again. The rich man, he wants now to go back and tell, wants to cross over, wants Lazarus to come give him a drink of water. Uh, can't do that. Why can he not do that? Besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Now, one of the great things about heaven will be the fact that there'll be no evil or anything that defiles inside of heaven. Revelation 21, verse 27. But one of the most horrible things, the most horrible thing about hell, is the separation from everything that's good, everything that's light, everything that's holy. Every good and every perfect gift, where does it come from? From above, from the Father of lights, James 1, 17. God is the source of love. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. God is the source of all goodness and hope and joy and rejoicing. And if you're lost, you'll be separated from that forever. Eternal separation. You know, one of the things about hell that makes it so bad is the eternal part of the separation. You know, if a person, and think about it this way, if it weren't eternal, we might could even tolerate it for some time. For example, someone gets a life sentence. He can, he can probably tolerate that because he could say to himself, he could, have, he could still have hope. He could say to himself, maybe my case can be heard again and it can be overturned. Uh, maybe he might think to himself, maybe I can escape from here someday. He might can even say, worst case scenario, I can get my life right, I can live for God, and there's a day coming, I'll be out of here and I can live with God in heaven. Even in scenarios like that, there's still a, a glimmer of hope. Friend, what makes hell horrible? There is no glimmer of hope. It's eternal. It lasts forever. There's never a day coming when you can say, only 999,999 days left. Never a day coming when you can say that. You can never say to yourself, won't be much longer now. I've got the hope that one day I can get out of here. It's eternal. It lasts forever. If I'm lost, it will be unending agony, torment, and separation from everything that is good and holy and right. Well, friend, let's not just focus on that side of, of eternity. Let's not just focus on torment and hell. Let's also be encouraged and end on a positive note by thinking about the beauty of that place called heaven. What's heaven going to be like? Heaven is going to be a beautiful place of rest. Hebrews 4 verse 9 says this, There remains, therefore, a rest 
for the people of God. You ever have one of those days in life where you have just worked yourself to death? You've been, you've been busy, you've been involved in things, maybe you've been working out on the farm or in the field, and at the end of the day, you are just so tired, your body and your mind just won't hardly relax. One thing you long for is rest. Rest from those labors, rest from those works. Friend, the good news about heaven is it's a beautiful place. Heaven's a beautiful place of rest for all of God's children. No more will we have to fight the fight against sin. 1 Timothy 6 verse 12, No more will we have to resist the devil and his temptation, 1 Peter 5, 8. No longer will I have to be around ungodliness and immorality and sin and, and heartache and heartbreak. Heaven is a place of rest from all those things in this life that bring us heartache. What else is great about heaven? Friend, the absences in heaven make it a wonderful place. Listen to Revelation chapter 21, verse number 4. The Bible records this, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Here's the absences. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. You know, the things that give us the most heartache in this life, here's what won't happen on the other side. There'll never be a phone call in the middle of the night that someone dear to you has passed away. You'll never shed another tear. The Kleenex factory will go out of business. You'll never shed another tear. You'll never have, sor you'll never have sorrow. You'll, uh, when you wake up and you put your feet on the floor in the morning, sometimes it's kind of painful, isn't it? You'll never face that pain. Pain, sorrow, death, crying, heartache, sin, evil, wickedness. Revelation 21, 27 says, nothing that defiles will enter in all that's evil and ungodly and immoral, completely absent. Well, can you imagine a place like that? Absolute bliss, absolute happiness, joy beyond measure. Um, uh, Revela or Matthew chapter 19 and Matthew chapter 25, you hear these words, Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. A place of joy. And happiness, that's what each one of us is longing for. But here's the greatest thing about heaven. Heaven is where God is. Do you remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, verse 9? Jesus said, In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. When I was a lot younger, I can remember hearing about heaven, and I would think about the streets of gold. Can you imagine a street made of full gold. I used to think about the pearly gates and the, the walls of diamond and jasper and all the, the beautiful, physical, touchable, tangible things. And I used to think, man, that's the greatest thing about heaven. No, that's not what's great about heaven. What's great about heaven? God's there. Heaven is where God is. Jesus is there. The Bible teaches in Hebrews 1 verse 4, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And not only is God there, and not only is Jesus there, our loved ones who've gone on are also there. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse number 21 through 23, David's young son, from the adulterous relationship with Bathsheba dies. While the son was alive, David wept, he mourned, he prayed, he did what he could to plead for the son's life. But when he died, David in essence cleaned himself up and began to progress toward moving on with life. And the servants are kind of perplexed by this. And so here's what David says to him: He cannot come to me. I must go to him. David believed he was going to be with those people, his son, on the other side. And friend, our loved ones who've gone on before us, we have the hope that we'll be with God, that we'll be with Jesus, that we'll be surrounded by saints of old, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and that our loved ones, maybe you've lost somebody in the Lord who is really close to you, son or a daughter, husband or wife, father or mother, brother or sister, a really close friend. Friend, what's going to make heaven great? 
If you were a Christian, they were a Christian. Friend, you can have that fellowship with them unending for all eternity. Not in a place where time exists and where there's a last day coming. Eternal fellowship and joy beyond measure. And friend, here's one of the things we also want to mention about that beautiful place called heaven. Paul taught us in Romans chapter 8 that heaven is going to be worth it all. I want you to notice this verse with me. Romans chapter 8, verse number 18. The apostle Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, we understand Paul faced a lot. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was, uh, he was left in the sea. He was ran out of towns. He had rocks bounced off his head in various places in the book of Acts. He was left for dead. Paul suffered a lot. Why did he do that? I consider the sufferings of this present time, they're not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What's that verse teach us? Heaven will be worth it all. No matter what you have to give up, no matter what you have to suffer, no matter what you have to face or what difficulties there are or what persecution might come your way, friend, if you remain true to God, heaven is going to be worth it all. Let's then consider our eternal destiny. Friend, I want you to think seriously today about eternity. And I want you to think seriously about where you are with God as it relates to eternity. Remember, the Bible teaches it's appointed to man once to die and then the judgment. Like it or not, all of us are going to leave this life. And every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we'll give an account of the things done in the body, whether good or evil. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 10. If you stood before God right now, where would your eternal destiny be? Are you living your life? Are you a child of God? Are you prepared for the other side? Are you sure that you're a Christian, that you've obeyed the gospel? You see, my friend, the only way that I can make it through the judgment seat of God in a victorious and joyful way is I, if I'm a child of, of God, if I'm a member of the Lord's body. We say, well, what do you mean I'm a Christian, a member of the Lord's body? What does the Bible teach a person has to do to be saved? Well, listen to what the New Testament says. Jesus taught us that we had to believe He was the Son of God. John chapter 8. Verse number 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. I've got to accept the fact that Jesus is the way, the only way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except by Him. John 14, 6. As Philip is teaching the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts, the gospel, that they see water in the distance and the man realizes he's got to be baptized. Here's water. What hinders me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Do you believe Jesus is the only way to the Father, that He's the Savior of the world? If so, are you willing to repent and turn from a life of sin? You see, my friend, all of us are of an accountable age. We're of an accountable age. We've all sinned. Romans 3 verse 10 says, There's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Are you willing to turn from that sin and turn to God? Remember, we're not saying that we're all perfect. That's not the idea. But I want to make a commitment to do my best to turn from a life of sin and turn to God. Here's what the Lord said. In Luke 13, 3, and in verse 5, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Peter preached in Acts 3, verse 19, Repent and turn again. That's repentance. It is a 180 degree turn from sin to God. Repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 3, verse 19. Are you willing to make the good confession that Jesus is the Christ? Romans 10, verse 10 says, With the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, 
confession is made unto salvation. What do we mean making the good confession? Here it is, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Jesus said, if you won't confess me before men, Neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before the Father who is in heaven. And so would you make the good confession that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And friend, to have every sin washed away, to get into Christ, to be saved and on the road to heaven, would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Uh, listen to these Bible verses. Mark 16, verse 16, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Peter preached in Acts 2, 38, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. John 3, verses 3 and 5, Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Saul of Tarsus, who, who said to the Lord in Acts 9, verse 6, Lord, what would you have me to do? Saul of Tarsus was told, who we know of as the Apostle Paul, was told in Acts 22:16, 16, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You see, baptism puts us into Christ. Galatians 3, 27, where salvation is, 2 Timothy 2, verse 10, and the Bible teaches that's where we contact. Jesus' blood that saves, Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. And so, friend, we ask you today, would you consider with us, would you consider your eternal destiny? If you are a child of God, you've obeyed the gospel, then, friend, let's each look to our lives and make sure that we're living in such a way that God is receiving the glory, that everything we do bring him, brings Him honor in our lives, and that, and that the devil isn't trying to, the devil hasn't worked into our life in a way that's causing us to be lost. You know, God's children can also be lost. Some in the Bible had fallen from grace, Galatians 5 verse 4. And so we need to inch. What we're doing today is we're asking, let's examine ourselves. Let's test ourselves to see whether we're in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13 verse number 5. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. We hope that each of us will think seriously about eternal matters. There is nothing more important than your soul. Think about eternal matters. Let's make sure we're right with God. If you've never obeyed the gospel, we'd love to visit with you about that. And friend, if you are a Christian, the encouragement today is keep on keeping on. We hope you'll join us next time as we study more about God's truth. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the